Chicago Bulls seem set to allow the market to dictate the price for Kobe White. I'm going to talk about how that could backfire for the Chicago Bulls, even though it's probably the best play. We're going to get into that. Plus, we're going to talk about why this offseason may not be as exciting for Bulls fans as we're hoping it's going to be. Plus, continue our player evaluations, this time with Io DeSumo. We're going to get into all that and more right after this. You are now tuned in to Chicago Bulls Central, your number one place for all Chicago Bulls news and content. All right, Bulls fans, welcome to another episode of Chicago Bulls Central, your number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. Um, if you want to follow me, you can do so right off the top at CEO Hayes. It's CEO H A I Z E. If you want to follow the show, you can do so at Bulls Central Pod. But let's go ahead and get into it. So, the, one of the biggest topics and questions heading into this offseason is what's going to happen with Kobe White? Everything's gone up and down with Kobe from, uh, you know, last season around the trade deadline. A lot of people saying that they wanted to see Kobe White move. Uh, for a big at that point in time and to the Bulls holding on to him and then coming into this season Kobe White doing everything but score for the most part of the season extremely well showing growth in his playmaking showing gro- growth in his defense showing growth in his decision making ball handling and then towards the back half of the season his is the scoring coming along with that so you know Kobe White had a great season one of the best seasons by any Bull last season just when you look at kind of the, the conversation around him and how he changed that on the court with his game. But it's now left the Bulls in a situation to where Kobe has played his best basketball in a contract year, and there are some questions naturally around, like, how much of this is going to be sustainable for Kobe? And I kind of answered that question when I did my player evaluation for Kobe White. When you look at the way that Kobe White has improved, a lot of it is effort, right? A lot of it's focus. A lot of it is the game slowing down uh, for him. And then that scoring come along after the All-Star break, which we were just a better scoring team with Zach Levine, you know, playing a little bit more natural position as well, not doing as much as the ball handling um, after the All-Star break. But when it came down to it, right, I, I look at the things that Kobe White has improved on, and personally, it could could it come back and blow up in my face? Yeah. But I do think that those are things that are going to be sustainable for Kobe as long as he stays hungry. And be it in one postseason press conference so far in the ending, it seems like that's going to stay consistent for Kobe White. And so, you know, the Bulls planning to allow the market to really dictate that place for Kobe, it makes sense, right? When you look at the landscape and how, how teams that are going to have considerable cap space, Kobe White does not make a lot of sense for a lot of those guys. You look at the Houston Rockets, who are going to have the most cap space. Now, they do have, you know, they have guards there, right? And could they be looking at it? Like, again, it's the Houston Rockets. You never know what they're going to do. They could be a team that maybe makes an offer for Kobe White. And keep in mind this as well, and this is something that I do want to point out. Just because a team signs Kobe White to an offer sheet doesn't necessarily mean that that team is is planning to, to keep Kobe. A lot of times, we saw it with Zach Levine, right? I, even though I think the, the Kings would have held on to him. But if you have all Kobe need and his agent needs is a team that has cap space that is going to be willing to sign him to an offer sheet to kind of push things along for the Chicago Bulls. And now with the new CBA, the Bulls only have 24 hours to match any deal. They don't have you know a longer time to kind of evaluate it. That could put pressure on the Bulls. But the Houston Rockets are set to have the most cap space of any team this offseason with about 60, up to, up to about $60 million. Now, they have 13 rosters, 13 players already on their roster, and they have two first round picks coming in. So when you factor that in, it, it, it they may not be the team that is going to try to sign Kobe White because of that. But again, anything is possible. Next up, the San Antonio Spurs. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, this is the team that scares me the most. Because they have a guard. And Trey Jones, who's already going to be a restricted free agent, they can have $47 million in cap space with uh, having only 11 players on roster and one first-round pick coming in. That means that they can have the roster space, they can have the cap space, and if Coach Greg Popovich stays on, that's a, a, a coach that you can see thinking, hey, I can develop even more out of this guy with what he's shown. Um, so you, you, so the, And that's even after the Spurs took out took on salaries of Devontae Graham and King Birch. So, again, things that you can look look for. Now, if Trey Jones does leave in restricted free agency, they could very well look to pivot to a player like, like Kobe White, who's still extremely young, and they can develop. Next up is the Utah Jazz. They can have about $45 million in cap space. Now, the thing that, to me, is going to hurt the Utah Jazz and their ability to really, um, you know, maybe go out and try to sign Kobe White is the fact of they have 13 players under roster, right? Now, they do have decisions to make on Jordan Clarkson, uh, THT, 
Rudy uh, Gay and Damian Jones, who could all either opt in or opt out. I think they all have player options. That could drastically change things for them. And they have three first-round picks coming in this season. So, yes, the Jazz could make an offer to Kobe White. But, again, that's another team with everything that they have, the youth they have down there, the amount of draft picks they have coming in, unless they make another move, may be unlikely. Next up is the OKC Thunder that can have about $35 million in cap space, but they have 15 players on the roster and one first-round pick. I don't see it happening with the Thunder unless they do make moves. Now, if they make some moves and some trades to kind of break up some of that team, again, they're definitely one that could as well do that. So um, we'll see. We'll see. But, you know, they do only have four players. They have four players on non-guaranteed uh, deals out of that 15. So those four players could be removed to open up spots for their first-round pick. And any player that they do try to go after in free agency. So those those what they do with those non-guaranteed deals is really going to be important to tell us what they could do. So that would even increase their salary cap projection. Um, so you know, we'll we'll see. But they are a team that could have space. Next up, though, the Detroit Pistons. Now, this is a team that has 12 players on their roster. They only have one first round pick coming in, 27 million dollars uh in cap space they could have. When we look at kind of some of the decisions that they can make on some of their players, you know, maybe declining the option on Alec Burks. Um, and that would get them up to that, up to about $37 million in space. Now, they their guard rotation seems to be set. But bringing in a third guard like Kobe White could be something. And don't overlook their chance to try to be petty as well. And then next up is the Indiana Pacers. Now, there's a reason why I kind of think, and I'm worried about the Indiana Pacers probably more than what some people are going to. They have $27 million in cap space. They have 15 players under contract with three first-round picks coming in this season. But then when you look at uh, what they could do with Buddy Hill, uh, TJ McConnell, Daniel Tice, right? They can they can open up some cap space with those players, removing those players. So again, um, 15 players on the roster, three first round picks coming in. That can make it a little bit difficult to go after. But when you think about like having uh, Halliburton, Benedict Matherin, Kobe White as kind of your three guard rotation there, that may be enticing for them as well as taking um, a player away from their in division rival um, with the Chicago Bulls rivalry. They've kind of owned that the last few years, but again. So that's why I don't necessarily, this plan on allowing the, the market to really uh, set the price for Kobe could backfire. Now, I think you're taking a calculated risk there. I think, you know, everything is projected we're hearing is about between 12 and $15 million for Kobe White. And I think that's a fair price. When you look at what he's able to do now as a two-way guard off the bench or even being your starter, that's pretty fair uh, market value that I expect for Kobe White. But I'm still expecting Kobe to be back in a Bulls uniform. We want to see him continue to develop here. Shout out to the Cognac boys, my brothers over there, over at the Shy Bulls podcast, who they uh, asked the question yesterday, could Kobe White be the Bulls' Marcus Smart? And being that, they they talked about how, you know, Marcus Smart, they, they always kind of brought in point, point guards to start over Marcus Smart before they really kind of bet on him. So, you know. It could be. And you look at Kobe White, still extremely young, still has more than enough room to develop into something meaningful for the Chicago Bulls already. No means I say that he's already something meaningful. If he can maintain what he did after the All-Star break last season, bringing the scoring as well as the defense, the playmaking, that's a player that's going to be worth between 12 and $15 million a year. And so that's what I wanted to talk about. Now, with that being said, right, and talking about that contract with uh, Kobe White, the Bulls offseason – Unless they get trade heavy, right? And that means, even though some people don't want to hear it, that means moving tomorrow. That means moving. And I see you guys in the comment section like, well, let's just go out and get a port card. Let's keep the team the same. I'm going to tell you guys why that may be more difficult than what we expect, right? The Bulls right now, when you look at their salary cap situation, um, they are right up against the luxury tax. And by that, I mean with all of their cap holds, right? Meaning that if they sign... Uh, players for what their cap hold is for those that don't know when you have a player that's a free agent on your roster um, I can't remember how they calculate but you have what's, ca what's called a cap hold that's an amount of money that's designated for that player that still counts against your books until that player either resigns with you for a lesser amount or they resign with another team it's still held against your books so with the cap holds that the Chicago Bulls have right now they are already over the luxury tax right but that 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 could change with some things meaning that if they re-sign Vooch for lower than what his cap hold is, that goes away. If they don't re-sign or if Andre Drummond opts out, that changes that. But right now, the Chicago Bulls are not slated to have a bunch of cap space. And because we know that we are a team that does not pay the luxury tax, right? We, we don't pay the luxury tax. So when you look at it right now, the players that we have cap holds on, for example, Nikola Vucevic's cap hold is $33 million. Now, I think even most most of the high-end speculation on what Vooch is going to sign for is not going to be $33 million. 
Kobe White's cap hold right now is $22 million with a qualifying offer of $7.4 million. Again, Kobe White isn't getting $22 million more. He's not getting it from this team. When you look at Ayo Desumu, his cap hold, $5.2 million. I don't know if he's going to get that considering how he's played. So, again, those are things that, you know, it can lower that. So don't expect the Bulls aren't going to pay the luxury tax even by re-signing guys. But you got to look. If you re-sign Kobe White at $15 million, if you re-sign Nikola Vucevic at what he's worth, and I think the lowest you're probably getting on a Vuce re-signing is $18 million, the Bulls are right at that luxury tax line. So while, you know, I know we have these thoughts and I'm going to do, I'm still going to do videos on free agent targets and mid-level exception. Keep in mind, that is still without using the Bulls' mid-level exception that they're expected to have. It's going to be difficult for this team to make moves just in free agency. It's more than likely not coming via free agency. Now, again, they can get creative, sign in trades, move some deals. But ultimately, if this team is going to drastically improve, it's going to have to come via some trades being part of that improvement, right? Whether it is to free up cap space and then sign somebody else with that new free up cap space. But it's not going to be ex as exciting as what I think we're hoping it's going to be, meaning, a uh, Trey Jones may not happen, right? Uh, uh, right? Signing a Trey Jones, signing a Mike Conley as a veteran, signing even a Derrick Rose may not be likely to where the Bulls are. Now, Vooch does go elsewhere. That completely changes some things. That opens up a little bit more things to use that mid-level exception. So we'll see. But ultimately, right now, the way that I'm looking at it is this. The Bulls, with where their cap situation currently sits at, it doesn't look likely that we're going to be very active in the free agency market. Trade market more than likely than anything, and we're going to have to open up some trades to where we take back back either lesser in salary or less players that we send out to kind of open some things up more for the Bulls. Unless AK has gotten in the Reinsdorf ear and convinces us to go into the luxury tax for at least this season to just kind of see what we do, especially considering the Alonzo Ball situation, maybe, but I don't think that that's likely either. This is going to be a season in which AK has to get creative again, and I know I've been saying that for the last week or so, but this really just brings it all home. When you look at the Bulls' cap situation right now, the luxury tax line is set at $162 million next season. With the Bulls, with their cap holds, their projected salary is $196 million. That's over $30 million above the luxury tax. We know that this team isn't paying that. So, you know, we'll see what happens, man. But um, ultimately, I think we may be need to prepare for ourselves of another season of potentially just running it back. and. I said that a couple of episodes ago that, um, as much as I hate to admit it, that's becoming more and more the likely scenario for the Chicago Bulls team. And if that's the case, man, the Bulls, you know, maybe they bet on the development of uh, Dalen. Hopefully we see Dalen Taylor a little bit more. Hopefully Pat takes a step up similar to Kobe this season. Hopefully Kobe even makes uh, grows his game more. But it's about to be a long season for the Bulls. Now, a player that had a long season, and that definitely factors in to what the Bulls do this offseason as well, is Ayo Desumu. And we're going to continue our player evaluation in this episode with evaluation on Ayo Desumu. When you look at his season averages last season, 8.6 points per game, 49% from, from field goal range overall, 31% from three-point range. The problem with that is those numbers are all below what he did his prior season in his rookie year. The points per game are right about the same, 8.8 .8 in his rookie year versus 8.6. I'll give him that. But he shot a worth, he shot 52% from the field last season down to 49% this season. He shot 37% from three-point range, down to 31%, taking the same 2.4 three-pointers per game. In every estimation, every way that you can measure, Ayo Desumu got worse last season. His true shooting percentage went down last season considerably, right? He, he went down from having a true shooting percentage last season of 59% to 56% this season. His PER went down from 12 last season to 10 this season. And his defensive rating, that went down. That's the number you want to see go down, 114.4. But we knew in watching the games, Ayo Desumu did not have the defensive season that he had last season. In every estimate, in every measurable statistic, Ayo Desumu regressed last season considerably. He became a worse player. Now, he's only 23 years old, right? He won't turn 24 until the middle of next season just about. So there's enough there to make. Maybe if it's a cap-friendly deal, the Bulls still bring him back, right? And I'm not here to say this isn't the spot where we talk about if the Bulls are going to bring him back or not. It's, it's possible to go either way. But in everything that you can evaluate, Ayo Desumu got worse. Now, he was a second-round pick, so there's something to be said about that. But the flashes that he saw, the defense that he showed us last season that really got his, him on the court for the Bulls, that went away. 
The shot making went away, right? Finishing around the rim went away. Io DeSumo season can't be anything less more than a D minus to me. Everything. You came into this season as the starting point guard. And let me be clear. He earned that starting point guard role in the preseason. He played better than every other point guard on the roster in the preseason. And he earned that starting role. But he also earned losing it and earned being demoted down to the bench and even earned not getting minutes on the back half and in the playing games. He earned that with this play. And so when you will have to evaluate Io fairly, I can't give him anything higher than a D. And to me, it's a D minus just because of the expectations. Again, expectations aren't necessarily on the player. But again, you have to look at that. So unfortunately, Io uh, had this season going into restricted free agency. And you can say, hey, did this help or hurt the Bulls? I still think that the Bulls should have given him a three-year deal as a second-round pick because now you have one bad, one good season, one bad season to evaluate, and you have to pay this man possibly long-term money based off that small sample size, whereas if you would have given him the three-year deal, you could have had another season to say, okay, you had one good season, one bad season. What are you going to do for us in year three? We'll see, man. I, I Ultimately, when I look at Io Sumu and everything, I still want to see him in Chicago. Maybe that's just me uh, and, and me holding on to what he flashed la- at times last season and even sometimes this season. He had some good games this season, but it was few, it was few and far between. So um, the Bulls have to make a decision this offseason in I- uh, on Io DeSumo, and we'll see. We'll see what that number looks like and what ultimately he ends up getting here in Chicago. But that is it. That is my time for today. Make sure you are following the show at Bull Central Pod. You can send us any feedback, questions, comments, concerns. BullCentralPod at gmail.com. And lastly, if you want to leave a text message and our voicemail on this or any other topic, 773-270-2799. We are the number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related because of you guys. And like I liked in every episode on, go Bulls. Love you guys. See right if you can, y'all. Peace. This has been a presentation of The Breaks, Breaks, Breaks Media. Media. Media.